is now our island in the sun where our people left home. My name's Rex Egmoyes. I am the twelfth out of thirteen children. And though they sail against their will, these shores are now home to what's left of us still. Our My mum actually raised fourteen of us and uh, I am the child of Jimmy and Desma Egmoyes. We grew up in Nambour. My dad was born here in 1901. My grandfather was taken from Cape Lisbon over on Santo Island and uh, my grandmother was taken at a different date, different time, uh, up at uh, Termaly, which is up near Big Bay on Santo Island. The blackbirding went on from 1863 till 1904, even though they were still doing it illegally, till 1907 or perhaps even more. Those ships that they were using were ships that Abraham Lincoln had turned away from over there in America. So um, uh, we got all the data on the ships' names and all the people that and uh, how they how they were being used. There was a lot more islanders that were around this area back at the time, um, where our local dump used to be. It used to be called Malaita Hill because a lot of the islanders were living up there. Um, we had a place out there in Dillabar. It was spelt D-I-L-L-Y back in those times, and it was Dillabar Mission. It was Coast Creek Mission, and a lot of those held a lot of the islanders from around this area. So I'm actually third generation full blood descendant of the Kanakas, and my mum and dad are both second. Yeah. Mate, we have a proud heritage, you know. I can't help but smile when I, I think about you know, the cane, you know, even though our Morton Mill has been taken down now, but that's all we had to identify with is a sugar cane, you know. Uh, I've gone back over the islands. We don't speak the language. My brother Terry was telling me about how the older cane cutters and that, that knew the lingo, they'd stop talking when he'd walk in or, and they didn't want any of the younger ones to know. They said, it's time to move on. They didn't know whether they were ever going to get back to the homeland again. So they said, you're going to have to live in a white man's world now. And so it was time to move forward. And uh, I think I respect that, you know, in the sense that that's what they wanted for us and that's what we've got to do. This has always been a white community. When in my era, when I was growing up, it was only about five or six black families around here on the coast at the time. We grew up in a time when there wasn't a TV set. We'd go and sit on the steps and because Dad would want to listen to the wireless and listen to the news. So my brother Lance and them and Eric and Selwyn and them would play their ukuleles and guitars and my sisters always got out there and danced. We basically formed our own little theatre just in the streets, you know. And I was one of the little kids that were just sitting on the steps, you know, just listening to them. I suppose like I'm 60 years of age now and to think back into the 60s growing up in the school it's like I, I tend to put troubles and toils behind me and try to move on but yeah it was kind of awkward growing up in a white community with the people blowing on your arms every time you walk past them and touched them it was like as if the black was going to come off onto them, pass onto them. People would blow and wipe the desk just, uh, especially where you sat they'd put hankies down and things and I suppose you try not to let people see that you're being hurt by the, um, the way that they felt. I suppose I've even spoken to a few of my friends. Uh, we did a 40 year school reunion just recently and, I, and they asked me about what it was like as a black man growing up. And when I shared with them, they broke down in tears uh, in the sense that they didn't realize the depth of what we were going through at the time. It's so easy to see one side of a story, but there's something inside us that wants to let them know that, hey, inside we are the same, that we are. And so we use sports and we use our music to help bridge the gap that we felt. That, um, and it did help over the years. It uh, did help. Yes, it's in my bank account at Fallen in the Red. So I looked into the wood to see what God As far as uh, singing in the community now, I was, I've been singing here for 44 years on the coast and the dance band. We're still doing it today, doing all the show balls around the coast and that.
as, as much as I, I felt proud um, for the achievement that our people were finally being acknowledged, um, I felt at loss for the people that had gone that first started it, you know, years ago when they first got together and they started having meetings, you know, and uh, it, it was just sad thinking back that my mum, my dad, they're not going to know this, they're not going to see it, you know. I'd like to think that I carry my heritage in my, on my sleeve, you know, I, I wear island shirts everywhere I go <laughs> and uh, mate, I am so proud to be a Kanaka, you know. Um, people say that the word Kanaka belongs to the people overseas and I said no, it belongs to us, it belongs to us that were left here and the, uh, that uh, started the sugar industry. Uh, the word Kanaka, a lot of people think that it's a word, it's a derogative term that was used to, to put them down. But the word Kanaka to us as Egmaleses means that it made us united. We're one, we're family. Proud history, proud heritage. You know, never forget your culture, never forget your past, but to build on it, to build for better things, for what your forefathers wanted us to have. Mm. We are equal, we're as good.